everybody, and welcome to episode 92 of the IROC Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger, and I'm known everywhere on the internet as IROC Knits. And IROC is just Corey spelled backwards, and I knit in a rocker recliner. And I have a little bit of a frog in my voice because I had an amazing weekend teaching at the Wisconsin Madison Knitters Guild Knit In. And I was really stressed about going. <laughs> I have so much to tell you. I haven't taught in two years. I taught four classes that had all kinds of stuff I needed to bring and organize. And I just kept thinking, I'm gonna forget something. And then I had to, I went alone. Um, it's a five hour drive. So I had to drive over and teach for three days and then drive back. And I did get a little, you know, just a little bit of a frog um, toward the end there because I had have not talked for three hours in classes. <laughs> in a long time. It was really fun. I'm going to tell you all about that in Corey's store. What am I wearing today? I am wearing one of the oldest items in my wardrobe and it is a vest and as I was packing for my trip I had to take out all the sweaters because I was teaching a sweater class and we have started to house some of the sweaters in the basement in those stair light boxes with lids because my closet is so full. And so I was down there, we were digging around and there were a couple of things down there that I don't always bring out for winter and this was one of them. And I thought, I don't know that this isn't even my style anymore, but it is a cabled uh, knitted vest. It has little bobbles here and it is no longer available on Ravelry. Just looked before I kind of inter you know, started the introduction here and but I have a note on my project page and I thought this is perfect. So we're gonna start right out with that little Corey story, like, apparently. This vest was knit in Sirdar Fizz. So it had novelty yarn up and around the collar. And I'm sure that that at the time was the thing that appealed to me. And it had like little pieces of almost like paper-like yarn that stuck out of it. The yarn was called Sirdar Fizz. So you can go look it up if you wanna see what it was. But after we purchased that yarn I and I knit this and I don't remember how I was made aware, I might've gotten some type of message because you know this was 2005. So this is, well, maybe, anyway, pre ravelry it doesn't really matter. I found out that that Fizz yarn was highly flammable. And it, you know, you could like go near something and it would, and tons of people were making fun fur scarves out of it at the time. And so they took it off the market and they, they kind of put the word out. And so I ripped it out from around the neckline of this at the time. I, I really don't remember doing that part, but they were suggesting that everyone just throw it away. Isn't that wild? And so I, I ripped it out and then I it didn't have like the fun factor anymore for me. Not that fun fur would be probably as appropriate today as a six year old woman, but whatever. Um, and so I found this black and white turtleneck that I started wearing under it. Right now, it is not the style that I'm um, accustomed to wearing because it's a little short and I'm trying to cover the extra COVID weight a little bit. <laughs> and so it's a little short, but it won't matter for you today because you're not going to see the bottom of it. <laughs> and to see, but I'm I'm loving the yarn. The the yarn is just lovely. Um, My project page as cabled vest slash waistcoat, and I do think it was called a waistcoat in the pattern name. But I knit this in Carabella Yarns Aurora Eight. I use four skeins in a dark gray, and it is just lovely. This yarn is just lovely. And it says I knit it in 2005. But the reason that I thought I could just share it today is because I went out on Ravelry and typed in cabled vest and like 50 to 90 pages of, the, one, one search I did had 50 pages of, of the cabled vests. And it's just a really nice way to use up four skeins of kind of worsted weight, or DK weight, if you have those in your stash, they're not big enough for a sweater. And so you could just make it sleeveless and kind of keep it for yourself in, in a vest form. So I thought, well, I'll just wear it today. <laughs> I probably, I don't even know the last time I wore it. 
but it is really lovely on just soft and easy to to wear kind of a transitional season so there you go jumping right into audiobooks of the week the first one i listened to was called northernmost and i forgot to talk about it on the last podcast i had finished it and i went to type up the show notes afterwards and i was like you completely missed that book <laughs> so i'm just telling you this week does it really matter in 1897, Odd Einer Eide returns home from a near-death experience in the Arctic, only to discover his own funeral underway. His wife Inger, stunned to see him alive, is slow to warm back up to him, having spent many sleepless nights convinced she had lost both him and their daughter, who traveled to America two years earlier, but has not yet to send even a single letter back to them in Hammersfest, their small Norwegian town at the top of the earth. So it's the story of this family, takes place, you know, the 1900s, um, and it tells the story of what happened to him and how he was stranded in the Arctic and, and the long journey it took him to get back. And then once he got back, they had thought he was dead. And their daughter, who has left to go to America, they send her to America to kind of save her and to have a better life. And then she never contacts them. So very interesting, quite well done. Um, I did really enjoy it. It is by Peter Guy, G-Y-E-E, -E, and G-Y, G-E-Y-E, -E. <laughs> and I had read, uh, you know, the other book by him that we talked about on the podcast, so I, that's how I picked it up. Okay. The second book I read is called The Heart's Invisible Furies by John Boyne, and this won several book awards in 2017 and 2018. It had been on my list for a while, and it finally moved up in Libby. But it's by the author of The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, which was a book and then became a movie, which some of you may recognize. Cyril Avery is not a real Avery, or at least that's what his adoptive parents tell him, and he never will be. But if he isn't a real Avery, then who is he? Born out of wedlock to a teenage girl, cast out from her rural Irish community, and adopted by a well-to-do, if eccentric, very eccentric, Dublin couple via the intervention of a hunchbacked redemptionist nun, Cyril is adrift in the world, anchored only tenuously by his heartfelt friendship with the infinitely more glamorous and dangerous Julian Woodbead. So it is, again, one of those stories that takes place in the past, and you're going to learn all about the 1940s in Ireland and this pregnant mother who gives up her son. And yeah, it was good. I, I enjoyed it. Again, I love it when I have good books several in a row. <laughs> I talked about that last time. The last book I read is called Winter Counts by David Huska Wanbley. And I sent this book after the fact in an email to both my brother and my father. And my brother is a city planner in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And he said that that was the Sioux Falls book pick. That they're, you know, how some communities do a book pick and then they recommend a book. And this is all about a Native American reservation in South Dakota. Very, very well done. Highly recommend it. If, especially if you're looking for diverse authors to read, which I think we all should be doing so we can kind of learn something new. Virgil Wounded Horse is the local enforcer on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. When justice is denied by the American legal system or the tribal council, Virgil is hired to deliver his own punishment, the kind that's hard to forget. But when heroin makes its way into the reservation and finds Virgil's own nephew, his vi vigilantism suddenly becomes personal. He enlists the help of his ex-girlfriend and sets out to learn where the drugs are coming from and how to make them stop. It, it, it's really good. It follows several different storylines, not difficult to follow, but it, there's some meat to this story. Uh, it really talks about the, the hardships of the, some of the people living on the Indian reservation. So if you can get, you know, get this one either to listen to or to read, Winter Counts, and it, it, it was just really eye-opening, and I grew up in South Dakota. 
I know what the reservations are like. And I, yeah, highly recommend everyone go out and read that one. I've got a recipe. I've got a couple of recipes. I forgot to do a recipe last time, I think, or either got, maybe it got a little too long. This recipe is from Amber Lindemann, the yarn hoarder, who I know many of you miss. She's doing great. They're building a new warehouse. And so it has been an all in project for the family. And they are going to be moving where Amber works in their second location into this warehouse. And it's, they, you know, it's a printing company. So stacks and stacks of books and papers. And so she's, you know, she's working a ton, but her sister, is a nurse and had this recipe and so amber sent it to me she had uh, printed it out so she took a picture and sent it to me and we had it and it was quite good taco soup one pound of ground turkey a half a chopped onion a package of taco seasoning a package of ranch dressing fry in the pan together mix that all up get your you know turkey gr browned can of pinto beans can of black beans can of rotel I used uh, spicy and I wish I would have used the mild. A can of stewed tomatoes and a can of corn. Do not drain any of the cans. I was really iffy. This makes the liquid of the soup. Serve with Fritos, sour cream, and cheese. Delicious. Tons of flavor. Husband loved it. He ate it while I was gone because he was home alone and... Uh, he had to, you know, have food to eat. So we had put half of it. It made it quite a bit for two of us. We, I think we ate it two nights and then he put the rest in the freezer so that he could eat it because he said, this will be good for when you're gone. <laughs> so there you go, taco soup. Kind of a easy, got some cans and some packages in your cupboard and there you go. It'll be, you know, it'll be done. I have a finished object to share just because they're darling. I don't usually do FOs on the podcast. Well, let's be honest, I don't usually finish things that are FOs anymore unless it's a design. But I'm slowing down, I'm doing less, and taking on less, you know, design work. And so I had knit this little gnome a year ago, two years ago, and I really enjoyed this cable pattern. If you do double points, you have one cable on one needle, a second cable, and then a third cable. And so the, the, the repeat is easy to kind of get through. It was really fun to make. After about the fourth or fifth row, it became very intuitive about what you needed to do next as you got to it, because you knew it needed to cross left and when it needed to cross right, I really could get the hang of it. Uh, I bought this as a kit and um, through Muse 2320, a yarn store here in Minnesota, she had kitted them up. So you got a, a, this is kind of a lopy yarn. You got a skein of that, and then you got a little balls of this. You got a little tiny piece of cream yarn. You got the stuffing. You got the beans to put in the bottom. Really nice little kit. I have no idea if she still has some available in her shop. I, I, I didn't think to look, but I bought two kits. I bought a red kit and a green kit. So the green kit, as I'm organizing the office, we are going to update our office. So we had a guy, a guy come out um, who does custom cabinetry and we just need a better working space for ourselves. We've had the same desk and credenza for a number of years. The, the drawers are, are getting crooked. They don't work well. We both sometimes get frustrated with all the stuff that's in there, um, all the knitting stuff that's in there. I, the closet is, the office closet, which I've shown on the podcast before, is full to the ceiling with Sterilite boxes of yarn. And I, so I've been trying to, because sometimes I just stuff stuff in there that I know what it is, I know where it is, it's very organized, but I have outgrown it. And so I was I was just saying, I, you know, I had all these beads in these plastic bags, and so I put them in a box together and labeled it. I've just been trying to do some of that because we're gonna have to take everything out if we, we have this desk made to fit with the credenza and we're going to, I think we're going to have a window seat put in front of the window. We have a bump out and I have a little bench with a lifting lid on it, but it's small and it was supposed to be for yarn, but it has paperwork in it because someone thought he could store his stuff that didn't fit in the credenza anymore. <laughs> and so if we put a bench in there that's larger with bigger drawers, we would be able to s store 
some extra paperwork or things like that, and then also some yarn. So that's why I found the green, the little green gnome. And so I had really enjoyed knitting that. This took me like two, two, two days, two nights, um, when I was sitting down to knit. When I really put my mind to it and power through and you know stay off Instagram and, and watching something that's good to watch, I can get things done pretty quickly. There's a different cabled pattern on the body and uh, and then you stitch the um, you stitch this together and you stuff it. It tells you exactly when to stuff it. Then I made a little pom pom out of the leftovers. But I was knitting these little I cord arms. You just make two little pieces of I cord, little short I cord. And I had remembered a t seeing a tip from Patty on um, Instagram, and I had learned this I believe from my knitting mentor Rosemary who uh, you know I've talked about before but you know how you get like when you knit a piece of I-cord you can get like a um, ladder and they can be kind of square I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that right like this is like definitely has like sides to it because you knit them on double pointed needles and you're sliding and um, what you can do to make that all even out is just to which is what I did to the other one and you'll be able to see that that one is much more round than this one, is you just take your eye cord and you just rub it in your hands, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It evens out all the stitches and it takes away that little ladder that you might have where you have a gap between your double pointed needles. I don't know if you're gonna be able to tell, but it completely rounds everything out. So before I sewed this arm on, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna leave it off and I'm gonna show everyone that little tip or trick today. So there's your tip or trick. I highly recommend these gnome patterns. I wrote Sarah uh, Shira of Imagined Landscapes, a very nice detailed message from designer to a designer. Um, the name of the one that I knit is Here We Gnome Again. She has about 18 knitting patterns on Ravelry that are gnome themed. She has a sweater and a hat and then she does these gnomes in all different shapes and sizes and different yarns and then she does a mystery knit along every year now. She's kind of become the gnome lady. So I just wrote her a note. The way she wrote this pattern was lovely. It was so detailed but not overworked with words and the the having the cables each one on a double pointed needle was just everything it just flowed and it made it so enjoyable to knit and i just wanted her to know and so i i just wrote her an email and said hey so um, in here there's a little there's a little gnome and then the bigger gnome so yeah i thought well i'll share it because i also want you all to know how wonderful sarah's patterns are i have a tip or trick second tip or trick today this is what I did in the last few weeks to get um, to get my numbers organized. I have several slips of paper in the office with measurements on it <laughs> for how long I want my things and sleeves and necklines and as I was sorting. So this is what I did. I took a picture of a favorite sweater. This is my Friendship Road sweater that is a smaller size here and a little bit bigger size here, which suits me really well right now. And I just wrote down all the measurements of the sweater on, so I took a picture on the bed, printed it out, and then I put nine inches, 11 inches, 13 inches, 21 inches, six, in, and I, I measure, I, every little, you know, how big, how big across should my arm be? How big across should my chest be? How long is this? How long is this? And then I took, another picture of this and saved it in my phone. So now I have a place where I have it on paper, but it's also my phone. So if I'm knitting somewhere at knitting group or whatever, and I can't remember the measurement I prefer, which is often different from the pattern that I do, this is just gonna be great to be able to have that in my phone, have it in a folder. I put it in, in a folder where I keep lots of um, patterns and sock numbers and things like that but I just thought it was just a really nice it's very visual it, it you know I could have written it out like neck nine inches but for me this really helps keep everything visual so I thought there we go I'll share that today give you all that 
I have been watching Inventing Anna. That was a few weeks ago, but I had the note in my phone to talk about it. It's an American drama uh, miniseries created and produced by Shonda Rhimes. So you know it's going to be good, right? Because she has a golden touch. It's inspired by the story of Anna Sorokin and the article in the New York titled How Anna Delvey Tricked New York's Party People by Jessica Pressler. And this is that young woman who borrowed money and lived in the hotels and did not have money and said she was uh, kind of an aristocrat from Europe and her father wouldn't send her the money. And she gave out $100 bills as tips and she was just bilking people because she was trying to start this artist's oasis residence place where the wealthy people would buy a membership and she was trying to buy this building and she got really close before she got caught. <laughs> she almost made it happen until a couple of people figured out the people who were going to loan her some money and some of that started to fall apart. She, she was on yachts in the Caribbean with people. I mean, she just, and, and she has a sense of style. Her clothing is really and she's a really quirky character. So I think she spent a couple years in prison and she's out now and she's done some interviews since. But if you're looking for something to watch that you just don't have to pay like super close attention to, but has a very interesting storyline, I would recommend Inventing Anna. Then I got caught up on The Good Doctor and Grey's Anatomy. Those are two that I've been watching for a long time and I just tape them. And then once I get like three or four, I will just watch them in an evening because Ross goes to bed fairly early because he's such an early riser and then I start knitting. Sometimes I'm on the computer so I'll have them on the TV in there. And so I just need a few to kind of get me to that one or two o'clock hour <laughs> when I decide that I really should go to bed. Are you guys struggling with the time change? Driving home yesterday, it was sunny in the car and I thought, don't get tired, don't get tired. Stop and get another Diet Coke if you need to. And I was just pretty jazzed. You know, I'm such an extrovert and talking to people for the first time. Anyway, uh, so I've been watching, that's what I've been watching. And popping back in here after I stopped recording, started editing, because I forgot I've also been watching Project Runway, which I love. I love that show. Uh, the people are so creative. But Katie Cortman was on this season, and I follow her on Instagram and have for a while because she's a knitter, and she mostly designs textiles, and that's kind of her claim to fame and all the bright colors and... Uh, interesting prints she mixes and matches things so if you would like to follow someone who makes your feed happy this is Katie Cortman art here I'll try to hold it up it's Katie Cortman art so all K's Katie and Cortman and she just has a really fun happy energetic feed see look at all the color and she didn't make it to the end of Project Runway, um, but she she got pretty far and she just has a, a really different style. It would be, you'd be hard pressed to say that everybody would love her stuff, but following her on Instagram, when she comes up in your feed, it's always happy. And so I just thought I'm gonna give a little shout out here and I kind of forgot, but I had a note in my phone. So there you go. Okay, things I saw on the internet. There is a Ravelry group called For Sale. This is a group for individuals who sell, wish to sell off any of their personal stash, yarn, fiber, tools, books, and magazines. I have been getting asked in the Knitting Exchange group and the Knitting Exchange Instagram account if people can sell yarn in that group. And I just want it to be whips, things that people don't want anymore, finished projects that don't fit or whatever. I just want to keep it as garments. I don't want it to become a bigger um, task for me than it is. So I kind of went looking for this. And so if you want to know, I have the link in the show notes. It's Ravelry.com and then group slash groups slash four dash sale. And that would be the place that you could go and do those items. Then I've had a little couple of things in my folder for a while, and I so I just want to mention them, but I'm not sure 
if the need is as great, but sometimes we all knit things that we want to donate, we don't know where to give them. So Freedom Street Health on Instagram is looking for Minneapolis knitters, but I would assume that you could send stuff from anywhere, for warm cowls, mittens, hats, socks, and wrist warmers for homeless folks. So the email is freedomstreethealth at gmail.com. And you can go over if you're on Instagram or you could email them. If you have like maybe even some pieces that you've worn and you just don't wanna keep anymore, they're just looking for things for homeless folks. And then the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation needs children's coats, gloves, and hats. So, and I, I'm assuming that, that it's Pine Ridge, South Dakota. It's still cold for another month and a half there. And so it's at tenaciousranch.com, and that is a website, but also on Instagram, Tenacious Ranch, who posted that need in February for items of clothing for children. And since I just read that book about South Dakota Indian Reservation, I thought I'm going to also mention that. So the links are in the show notes. They'll be on, in Ravelry, but they'll also be in the down bar below this podcast, so you can just go down and I highlight it and look it up. Then I had someone send me a picture on or show me a picture and of this postcard with all these little hashes on it. And I was like, that is brilliant. So Heidi and Lana are two people who did do knitting designs. They have 21 patterns on Ravelry and they make kits for their patterns. So here is one of the kits. It's a poncho, and here are the colorways that they have that you can purchase it in on their website. And the kit includes three skeins of Heidi and Lana Meadow Fingering Yarn, which is a merino alpaca blend, the pattern, the stitch markers, the progress marker, the row count keeper card, a pencil and a tapestry needle all in the kit which would be an awesome gift for someone if you were looking to give you know a knitter a gift because they would just get everything all at once but this is to keep track of your rows isn't that brilliant there they just have the repeats in there front one 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 two three four five and so you wouldn't have to make your own post-it note. <laughs> and I don't know that they do it for every single one of their patterns. I would assume so if they got, if they're smart enough to kind of get this going. I just found that fascinating. And so this is the Discovery Row Count Keeper. And this poncho was called the Discovery from Heidi and Lana. And so they, and then I linked through on Ravelry and then I was like, oh my gosh, they have a website. Oh, they kit things up. And so you get three skeins of yarn and all that other stuff with the little counter. So you rock Heidi and Lana. Don't know who they are, but that is awesome. You know, I do my checklist patterns. All my patterns I write out in checklist form, which makes the really the whole pattern hard to print because it's got so many pages. But I get really good feedback from people. They really like it. Even pretty skilled knitters say, you know what? It was just easier to mark it off, go, one, I've done 10 rows and mark it off and know where I was at than to just not print it out. So yeah, there you go, Heidi and Lana. All right, I have a little special note here. I have a friend who needed some help with some knitting, so she came over and she was telling me about this yarn she bought and it's June Cashmere, which some of you might've heard of. Um, I had definitely heard of it, but I don't own any. And there is a video on their website about how this family moved to Karzikistan, a husband, wife, and two or three children to help get the cashmere yarn from the farmers. They didn't have a way for the people who were raising the goats to get the cashmere to in production. There was like a, a missing link there that they would be up in the uh, you know high mountain regions and then they would have this cashmere but they didn't have a way to get it so this family does it super interesting june cashmere is 100 percent cashmere fibers collected directly from the kurzik shepherds living on small family farms 
along the ancient Silk Road amidst the soaring mountains of Central Asia. June is the Kurzic word for animal fiber, which is a centuries-old vital resource. Um, so this, they have 100% um, cashmere yarn, which is just a treat. I have had two or three um, skeins of cashmere in my life, and it is, you know, a really special um, treat. Oh, here's the family. I did print it out. Four children. There's the family, and then there are... And then here are, here are the goats and the mountains where they're raised. So you can go to junecashmere.com and there was an entire blog post about what the consequence of the war in the Ukraine right now is doing to Kyrgyzstan. Whenever we talk about the founding of June Kashmir, we recount the history that led to Kyrgyzstan's need for economic development. Like Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan was once part of the Soviet Union. It was part of the thriving textile producing region in which shepherds belonged to cooperatives. The mills in turn had a vast market in the Soviet Union in which to sell their goods. And so there's a whole, here's a mill that was completely trashed. It's in ruins. So this little blog post is just so necessary for us all to read and to understand it's just i printed it out so i'd have it i'm not going to read it all to you um, but please go to june cashmere and look at some of the blog posts and think about whether or not you might want to support those people who are literally hand harvesting the cashmere and the journey that it has to take it to get to them from them to us it is pricey the DK weight skeins, you get 150 yards in 50 grams, and they're $44. But the light fingering, you get 308 yards and 50 grams. So you get quite a bit more in your fingering weight skein um, of cashmere yarn. I mean, and just think about, you know, who you're helping in that situation. So yeah, I wanted to share that on the podcast. Let's talk about the sweater of the week. I have a kind of scooched over here I guess I, I didn't maybe I need to pull it a little closer okay I'll put a picture in I think this is the men's zipped raglan by Joelle Hoverson it came out of the last minute knitted gifts book there are two books and there's a more last minute knitted gifts that Joelle wrote many years ago I purchased the book when I lived in Virginia and there are 31 patterns in the book, I think. And they're all like little items, you know. But at the back was this sweater. And I was like, how can that possibly be a last minute knitted gift, right? It's knit on pretty heavy yarn. It is a US 9 needle, 14.5 stitches and four in inches. I knit it with Monostel Uruguay. Classica. Um, the book is available on Amazon anywhere from $2 to $11 in the used section and it's also available brand new. Uh, it's $8.48. I mean there's just lots of... It came out in October of 2004 but those patterns, getting 31 patterns in that little book that are all quick and easy to knit um, it, it, I, mean, it's, I think it's a value. Hand knit sweaters for men present a constant challenge. Not only are men hard to design for, their sweaters can be so big that they take forever to finish. This sweater is knit using a chunky wool and is made in one piece in order to keep the knit moving along. The red zipper, a modern touch, provides an element of color and fun while still keeping the sweater looking masculine. It also gives a man the option of wearing the sweater open if he's the type that gets hot easily. I knit it for women. I don't think Joelle would call this a men's zipped raglan anymore because we have moved out of that. I have more women that come to some of my knitting classes who knit for men, but also knit men's sweaters for themselves. So I think she would probably call it unisex now. I did have a zipper put in. I knit it three or four times. I Because it's 100% um, wool, I gave it to several um, of my daughter's barn trainers with her horse. Um, it's, it's just a perfect 
work sweater, barn sweater, um, you know, working outside sweater. It's ribbed. It has this um, kind of funnel neck that sucks in once you put it on. It, I just really think that it is a, it's a great sweater. This is mine. I've never knit it for a man. Um, it goes from chest 39.5 to 51. Um, I did use the Monos, which is 100% hand spun kettle dyed wool, 137 yards to 100 grams. So it's a chunky, bulkier yarn. Um, and it knit up really quickly, really quickly. So I thought, I haven't shared this on the podcast. It used to be in the sweater class. It got bumped out for some newer stuff because sometimes I'm like, a lot of the things that I talk about are old, old projects. Not that the patterns aren't good anymore, but I kind of want to update. And this came out in 2004. And I knit it probably in um, three times in the last 10 years, though. Um, I didn't knit it early on. It, yeah, it's just a great sweater, really nice. And I, I know it's dark, so it's probably hard to see the de details, but it, it's basically just a ribbed sweater and it just has so much give. I'm gonna try to show you here with my, like, right? It's just, there's just a ton of give in it. You can just, it's loose. It's not, it's not fitted. If you make the right size, it just hangs, just, you know, yeah. Great little sweater. We all know that there is a war going on in Ukraine and that they have been being bombed and there are people that are fleeing and people want to do something. So Ravelry last week put up a list of, on their front page. So if you go in the upper corner and click on it um, of Ravelry, it will bring you to this front page, which will talk about Ukrainian designers but I made a list prior to them coming out with that. So I went out on Ravelry and searched Ukraine um, under the designer tab, and there are tons of them, but I listed four. So Tatiana Skobolos, Katerina Mushin, Ala Patusik, and Yulia Kachinko, and I list linked in the show notes their Ravelry stores, and you can go buy patterns from them, and that money will go directly into their pockets. So I wouldn't think that there's a single Ukrainian designer that doesn't need you to buy some patterns from them. Another thing that people are doing is they're buying patterns on Etsy, so that's an option for you. And then some people are going together in groups and they are renting Airbnbs or BRBOs and not showing up because those people get a down payment when you sign up. And so you can pay for their place and not go and they get that money directly because you know that they're not having any visitors, right? I, I mean, the Ukraine was a place that people went to visit to look at the beautiful city and the architecture and all that kind of stuff. So if you have a group, a knitting group and you wanted to kind of do a collection and rent a space or a room, you know, for I would assume I did not look that up, but I'm assuming that they're just like a couple hundred dollars you could get. You know, you could rent it and that money would go directly to that person, too. Sometimes giving to just huge organizations, you know, whatever. <laughs> the people don't get all of it and you just don't know how to help and you know you give your twenty dollars but you know ten of it is going for administration costs or whatever and so um, a friend my the friend that was over to talking with me about June cashmere we were talking about what we could do like how we could help and so I said I have a list and so we are purchasing patterns whether or not we will ever use them you can just go out and click on a few you know most of us probably have some patterns that we're never going to knit in our and you know and that little expenditure doesn't distress us too much so if you want to support pump someone in the knitting industry in that way even if they have fled they would have access to their paypal account which is where that money goes so even if they're not there anymore right they still would have access via their paypal that's how they would get the money directly so i just thought that's the way to go for me, right? People that really need it. I started following someone on Instagram who has been posting some stuff from the Ukraine. She's a designer. Oh, let me look and see if I can find her name. Okay. She is underscore Olesia 
underscore knitting. And if, you, if you're not familiar with Instagram, at the bottom of any foreign language, there is a little top button that you can top that says see translation. And so you can read anyone's posts or anyone's introduction by just clicking on the see translation. So if you have not done that before, so you can read it even though it's in Ukrainian. Um, and so I started following her. She's the only one right now that I found, but of course I've been gone all weekend and I didn't spend a lot of time um, coming up with things, but she's been posting some stuff from Ukraine and you might be interested in that as well Let me tell you about my weekend. I Taught my skeins to skeins knitting trivia game on Friday night and I had to be there um, By six o'clock they were having a gathering of people where they were gonna have hors d'oeuvres and wine and um, things for people to sit and knit and then I was doing the knitting trivia game and you know how you have to be somewhere and you know you're driving there on Friday, uh, but you don't want anything to happen along your way and you don't want to have a flat tire. <laughs> All those things go through your head, right? Because you're the featured person that night. And I was just really nervous. Um, the, the Wisconsin Knitters Guild Knit-In in the past has been a pretty big event. It was not this weekend. It was well done and all pretty much the entire thing done by one woman Courtney I if you ever watch this I cannot say enough about how much hard work that would have been there were six teachers that were featured for the weekend one one of the teachers didn't show up she had the weekend dates wrong and she was from out of state and so that was a huge kerfuffle for people who had come to take the basket weaving class and so you know things happen as a designer or as a teacher where you just get stressed about that kind of thing. Um, but I got there and the the knitting trivia thing went pretty well. It's, you know, it's pretty low key and kind of fun. And uh, they had some fancy hors d'oeuvres. That was kind of nice. So it was a small group of people. I think there were maybe 30, 30 ish people in the room. Um, and then Saturday morning, I taught sweaters. Uh, that was That's always a three hour class. And that was full, 20, I had 20 people. That was the class limit on that. And um, hi to anyone um, from that class. It, it, it got a little um, carried away. You know when you haven't done something in a while and you're, you're, you start telling stories? <laughs> no, none of you know that. You know that about me let's be honest <laughs> you know so I'd, I'd go down a path telling a little story about a sweater or something and i'd be like oh so we need to get back on track so by the end of the class they didn't have as much time we tried on sweaters halfway through but by the end of the class people were anxious to go to lunch and get to the vendor market and stuff so um but i i took along you know 60 sweaters and did my little song and dance about that and in the people the knitters in that class were really fun so <laughs> they were just asking all kinds of questions and 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 that you know that engagement and I told them at the end of class that some of them are head nodders and head nodders are the best people in the world when you're teaching they're just people who occasionally nod their head at you so that you know that they're agreeing and paying attention and I had like two or three head nodders in the room and as a teacher that is the best <laughs> and I said everyone should be a head nodder and then afterwards I said to someone it's probably they're gonna all go to their next class and it's gonna be like bobbleheads right <laughs> Everyone in the room's gonna be like engaging with the teacher, but I just wanted to thank those people because when you're engaged like that, it helps a teacher keep their energy up. Um, and then in the afternoon, I taught Latvian braids and we did uh, my hat, Choose Your Own Path from the Minnesota 52 book. And I taught Corey's two color cast on, which, you know, is just a long tail cast on and so fun, but so much bang for your buck along the, your bottom edge to have those two colors kind of barber pulling and then they knit and then we did Latvian braids and some of them did Latvian braids right and left. Um, and someone came to class with their friend and she was not a knitter. And so, you know, I'm up there getting started. Does everyone know how to do long tail cast on? Everybody cast on too? And she raised her hand and I was like, oh, you don't know how to do long tail? Okay, well, you might do a different one, I'll show you. And then her friend said, no, she doesn't know anything. <laughs> so she'd paid for this Latvian braid class and so I made a knitter. <laughs> <laughs> Every time the class was knitting on their next section, I would go back, taught her how to cast on. Then the cl class would be knitting again. I went back, taught her the knit stitch. 
then the purl stitch. So at the end, of, we were all cheering, like I made a knitter. Um, it was a little, you know, weird up, up front, but she didn't seem to mind and she was not, you know, raising her hand all the time asking for help. She was just there to learn. They both knew how to crochet, her friend knew how to knit, and um, but she didn't. And so we got her going, got her started, right? And then uh, Saturday night, I was pooped, right? I've teaching, taught six hours of class, my foot hurts. I've been standing on it all day. Um, and I've hauled sweaters and folded sweaters and put sweaters away in, in giant suitcases and pushed them on the carpet on a luggage rack, which is super hard. <laughs> I was aggravated by the carpet. <laughs> But, um, so I was like, I don't know what I want to do for supper. Um, I talked to my husband. I talked to my daughter. I've kind of, after I got back up to the room, um, they both called for different reasons. And then I was like, you know what? I don't know if I just want to order pizza and stay in my room and just put my pajamas on. And there, it was at the um, Madison Marriott West. And so it's that tall building with the glass elevators, the kind of the atrium in the middle and all the rooms look out over this atrium. So they had this bar and then this kind of eating area. And I thought, you know, I'll just go down. I don't, somebody will be down there that I can sit down with, you know, feel a little weird, but I'm forward. So I thought, well, I'll just go down. There's a couple, there's a big table of knitters and then there was a golf convention going on. So there were some golfers over there that kind of walked by and I got down there and Carson Demers was teaching that weekend. And if you don't know Carson or have not heard of Carson, he is a physical therapist who works with knitters on hand pain, arm pain, position, back, neck, all those things. And he wrote an amazing book on the ergonomics of knitting. And so if you don't own it, you should go out and purchase it. But I had taken a class from Carson um, at Yarnover a few years ago. And I said, you taught me how to put a pillow on, uh, a towel underneath my rear. And he goes, I teach everyone that. <laughs> so when I met him, he's let his hair grow and it is kind of platinum gray. It is stunning. He's got just this thick, beautiful head of hair. And I said, did you know you had this hair when you first walked up to him at, on Friday night? He's like, well, yes, I, you know, years ago I knew that I had really thick hair, but it, it was just, and I said, it looks amazing on him. So he was sitting there, you know, and I could see him across the room because I talked to him about his hair and he just kind of was just finishing eating and he was by himself. And so I went over and I said, do you mind if I sit down? And he's like, oh no, help yourself. And it was probably, I don't know, six o'clock, five thirty, six o'clock. 10 30 I said we both really need to go and get ready for tomorrow can you imagine guess who chatterboxed Carson <laughs> we had so much in common it was incredible incredible the amount he's he bought a new house and we were talking about Broadway shows and we were talking about knitters in our classes and then we would go down a rabbit hole of um, things that we that you wouldn't ever talk to about with someone and then we'd be like oh my gosh you know and we were so we talked about superwash wool and <laughs> it was a lovely evening I mean it was just so nice to just sit there with someone I really had met once, but was, you know, talking to like I, you know, had known him for years, we decided we're besties now. We're <laughs> we had so much in common, um, you know, New York City and San Francisco, and I was telling him about downtown Minneapolis and, you know, the whole George Floyd thing and how our, our downtown has just become kind of a wasteland and, you know, people are afraid to go down there and uh, the homeless population has moved into the Nicolet Mall and how hard that is if you're working downtown to walk amongst those people who need, you know, their panhandling, but they, they need help. And and he said, the rest of the world doesn't know that, right? Like, we're, we're not being made aware of that. And I said, oh, yeah, no, but I think it's happening in a number of cities, right? I know when I went to Seattle, some of you said to me, don't stay in downtown right now. That, you know, there's just such a big homeless population. It's really hard to get around on the sidewalks, stay, you know, out a little bit. And because of what we knew, my husband's building was downtown and they've moved out of the downtown because you couldn't get to the 11th and 12th floors on the elevator with 50, 60 people in an elevator during COVID, right? 
and you have to have the bathrooms cleaned all the time and so you really need to have like a person that's constantly on that because people are using them or going in and out you you know you need to clean those surfaces so they literally moved out and so anyway we were talking about these things and and it, one thing just led to another led to another and <laughs> And then I said goodbye to him when I was leaving on Sunday. He was in the market. And I said, yeah, I think we talked like four and a half hours. He said, we did not. I said, Carson, I came down like at six o'clock. He said, that went so fast. I said, yes. I said, I, you know, we just chatted and chatted and chatted. It was, it was really nice. He is a lovely, very smart man. You know how when you talk to someone and you can tell they're well educated and they just know a lot and they have a great knowledge base of a lot of things and education i just love that like it you know that all that stuff <laughs> fills me up friday night after i did my session i called ross because i had told him i'll i'll call you after my session tell you how it went no and so i he, I said, are you in bed? And he's like, no, I haven't turned off the TV yet. And, you know, it's like 9.30, he goes to bed early. And, um, and then I proceeded to tell him all of the little snippets of my day. And then I went and got gas because the car was empty. And he's like, oh my gosh, you have been with people. <laughs> and you are bubbling up <laughs> with all the energy and all the things. He says, I don't need to know every little detail. Just kind of want to know you're safe and that it went <laughs> Okay, and I'm telling him about the hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> so anyway, I kind of got all filled up this weekend and, and I had kind of forgotten what teaching does for me. I've forgotten that I'm good at it and that I like it so much, right? Because planning for it was so stressful remembering all the handouts and everything that I needed to bring and all the accessories that have to be with that and and what folder and how many handouts and and don't forget a handout and it, like it was so because I just hadn't done it for so long that I had put those folders away I didn't have all of the choose your own path samples out they were they were all in the Minnesota 52 suitcase so like I had to go and, and just doing all that it was so stressful I was kind of telling myself I just can't wait till this is over, right? Like I just can't wait until Sunday night and I'm back at home and it's done because this has just been so much. And then as I got there and I, as I saw people knitting and it, this was a vaccinated and masked event and people just pretty much honored that. I took my mask off in class because when you're putting 50 sweaters off and on, you can't keep your mask on and I had COVID in January and I explained that to the group that for 90 days I should be I'm safe according to the doctors I checked with two people <laughs> and so it, I just there's no way and they understood that like sometimes you have to take my glasses off to put the sweaters on so if I'm constantly turning around taking the mask off it the class would have been five hours long um and then you know I have such a dry mouth you those of you who watched me for so long you know and so I just have to drink I have water and pop and after like every other sentence I'm constantly drinking and people were really really understanding about that and I didn't have anyone in my class who didn't wear a mask which was you know really nice since a lot of those mask mandates are being lifted everywhere right the vendors had masks on um, when people were eating on Friday night you know can't keep your mask on but even my classes if someone had a mask on and they wanted to sip their coffee they would like lift it or in their water and keep it on i mean that's you know that's honorable that <laughs> that was the rule right and you follow the rule if it wouldn't have been the rule then you know whatever but so i had a lovely weekend and i am scheduled to teach a couple more things and i hadn't really been putting many feelers out there because I was just feeling like, wow, I just don't know. It is hard to be gone for an entire weekend when that's a majority of the time that you see your significant other, right? And so um, he always says, that's how you get paid. You need to teach more. That's where you make a little extra money. Um, but then when I'm gone for the weekend, he's like, oh, I'm so glad you're home. It was really lonely here and I don't like to cook. <laughs> you know, I'm all by myself and you know, he said, I was, I kept busy, but it's just quiet, you know? So anyway, it was lovely. 
and I am going to put myself out for a couple more events and see if I can't um, put some more gigs out there. So if you are an event coordinator somewhere, let me know. Um, if you have an, a local yarn store that has a budget, which most of them don't, but if you have a local yarn store that likes to put on events, I love to do yarn store events, um, teach a class, teach two classes over a weekend, and um, yeah, and I'm cheaper than some of the big names, right? Because I'm still little in comparison to the big, the big folks who do Stitches and Vogue and some of those giant events, which they work really hard at those events because sometimes they're teaching five, six, seven classes in a weekend. I mean, I thought four was perfect. There was class on Sunday afternoon and I, I didn't have one and I, I was really glad because keeping your energy up that long would have been really hard. I did take a little video for all of you of the vendor market and so I will insert that so you can just see. Um, it was like about half the size the vendors told me but I talked to Jeanette and George of Sun Valley Fibers and I talked to Steve and Andy just briefly. Um, but there were, you know, I don't know, 20, 20 some vendors in the marketplace in a room. I did not shop. That is, you know, that's one of my, my rules that I engage for myself is that when I'm teaching, I don't buy yarn um, because I would pay, I could use my entire paycheck. <laughs> now that I'm cleaning out the office a little bit, I have lovely yarn I want to knit. And I'm putting it with some patterns right now. I have two or three that I'm gonna cast on, some sweaters, because um, I don't teach again now for another month, and I'm just finishing up the test knit for my project for the Shop Hop, and I'm do finishing up the Christina Cowl. I'm gonna do the call for testers today. I meant to do it at the end of last week, but I was so busy getting seven suitcases filled with stuff. Seven, I had seven suitcases that I took to this event, and my knitting bag, and my purse, and my pillow. I, it, I barely fit it on one, I couldn't fit it on one cart. I had to drag. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, that's Corey's stories for this week. Okay, I saved this for the very last because I, I recently have felt like my energy levels on the podcast and the, the things that I'm talking about have been a low and sad, and you will all know what I'm talking about. But I did share on last the last podcast that Cody, my our chocolate labradoodle, um, who is really mama's dog, had had a biopsy and, um, and there were some things that have been going on with him and we did find out last Monday that Cody has cancer and he's doing great he's feeling pretty good we don't we're not seeing any indication that he knows he has cancer yet um, he's 12 and he rests a lot 
he runs with my husband or walks two to three miles every morning and he still wants to go he's still eating um, but the cancer is in his rectum and I shared this on Instagram because I've had a number of you reach out to find out how he's doing in order to do a surgery to remove the lump there they then have to take a lot of that and they take some of the muscle and then the dog becomes incontinent and so then they can't they have to be diapered and um, they don't have muscle back there and and it's just not something our vet has done it twice and she said both times the dog was completely incontinent and you know you can't have a dog in the house if that's happening and he's a big dog so you can't diaper that and clean that up easily and I, it would bother him I know it would because he if he gets sick he he's really upset about it so um, we're just gonna love on him he's gonna have all the treats that he possibly can um, he's right underneath my feet right now um, and he missed me desperately when I was gone I mean he licked my face and my hands when I got home and he I mean I, I've been gone before but he just missed his mama and uh, he was right at my feet last night um, and we're just gonna love on him and we're gonna see um, how much time we have with him we will not allow him um, to suffer in any way we will not keep him alive for our sake um, because that's that's just not it's not where I'm at um, his back end has been atrophying for the last few years and his legs have gotten smaller and we really thought it was hip dysplasia and now there's a part of us that wonders if there's not some cancer in that lower back spine um, the cancer that he has could um, spread to his um, liver and lungs or it may have already been there and then it spread and that's why we had um, that abscess that he got which is now gone um, so and we could do MRI x-ray ultrasound to try to see if, if it's everywhere and how much of it is there or not and Cody really he does very well at the vet but he shakes the entire time and the anesthesia that they would put him under for a couple of those um, really bothered him when we had to do the biopsy he was kind of out of it for two days and so we have just decided that and the vet said you will know and you will see and you know you, you will understand um, right now she's saying anywhere from a couple weeks to a, f a few months we could get a, a number of months but we'll just play it by ear and I didn't want the podcast to be sad um, but I know many of you are animal lovers and that you will understand how heartbroken um, we are so today was the day of forgetting some things on the podcast so I just keep editing and adding in and editing in and adding in and so um, I did have one more little thing that I wanted to tell all of you um, last Monday the day that we found out that Cody had cancer my mother was in a fairly serious car accident um, she was hit in the side um, in an intersection and pushed uh, the car up the curb across the sidewalk and into a evergreen tree and before she knew it she was just looking at the branches of an evergreen tree she's okay mostly um, you know my most of you have watched for a while know that my mom has had a lot of back neck issues and surgeries over the years um, and she's just bruised and battered so keep her in your mind for me will you because it was a rough week last week especially Monday um, it was scary um, her ankle is bruised her, her her back and neck were not hurt the airbags did not deploy which is almost a good thing because if it would have I really think it would have hurt her back and her neck um, she had had a little surgery about 10 days ago to have her stimulator box removed from her lower back so she was wearing a kind of a girdle that she had to wear for two weeks um, but those stitches did not get damaged or broke open so um, I just wanted to add that because I know a lot of you you some of you know me very well you're you know you're close personal friends and then others of you have been with me for three years and so I just thought um, I had made a little note 
to share that. And right here before I upload to YouTube, I'm just going to add this in. Well, that's all I've got for today. Thanks for joining me. Welcome to any new viewers that came over from the Wisconsin Knitters Guild. I should have said that up front. I probably have a lot of new viewers coming over to watch the podcast for the first time. So welcome to all of you. Come in for your hug. I've been doing this since COVID started. Just give yourself a little squeeze there and know that I care about you. I think about you all and hope that you are keeping your spirits up. I feel like this uh, pandemic has been as much a mental pandemic as it has a physical pandemic for some of us who really struggle with some mental health and keeping our chin up and um, in the state of the world and the things that are going on right now can make you really sad. So I just wanna say that I, I really think about all of you. I love your comments below the podcast. It just really feels like I'm engaging. Um, but who was it? I wanna say T Simple Kelly was at the sweater thing this weekend. I think I have that right. And she always comments, and I should have asked at the beginning of each of my classes if any of the people that were in my classes are podcast watchers so that I could have said individual hellos to those people. It didn't even dawn on me because I haven't taught it so long that it was more, I was all, it was all about me. <laughs> I was nervous. I wanted to do a good job. I wanted to be on time. You know, we had the time change. So I was so afraid on Sunday morning that my watch and my phone were not going to jump forward and that I was going to be an hour late for my classes. You know, all my thoughts were self thought thought so anyway um, but hi to all of you that are podcast viewers that I met this weekend um, and I had just a wonderful time it was it was just really good for my soul so until next time keep it colorful keep your fork no green bananas waddle on buy the gravy you'll never regret ripping back. I think I got them all. Love you all. See you in a couple weeks. Take care. Okay, let's do the prizes. I have kind of rearranged and I'm standing because I have so many prizes to give away. It is just going to take a few minutes here. If you did not knit socks, hat or cowl for the pairs of socks knit along, you do not have to watch this section. I'm just going to read through what the prizes were, who got each one, and then those people need to contact me with their name and address. It's just going to take a few minutes to get through everything. I have it pretty organized, so let's get started here. The first bag, number one, goes to Nan Randa. So Nan, get in touch with me, and this will be in the mail to you. The second bag goes to North Lane. North Wind Knits, and that's Linda in Michigan. I should look at it before I start reading. Um, bag number three goes to Honor Crown, and that's Stephanie in Fort Collins, Colorado, and that was post 687. Bag number four goes to Jessie's Mom One. And I don't have a first name or a uh, state on that one, but uh, I can probably get in touch via Ravelry for that Ravelry name. And bag number five goes to Brainwaves. That's Mary in Minnesota. Number six is the Rocking Tote, and that goes to DM Brown. That's Danielle in Lexington, Kentucky, and that was post number 207. Number uh, seven goes to So Run It, that's Suzanne in Indiana. And I have a little addition here. I have been doing some back and forth with Susan B. Anderson, um, knitter extraordinaire, teacher, a lovely person in real life and owner of Barrett Wool Company. And they donated a $50 gift card to someone uh, in the cow for me to give away and they will email it to you. And that was after I'd done all of the drawings and everything this morning. And I was really struggling when I was doing the drawings to make sure that, you know, 
multiple people weren't getting prizes again and again. And so I, when I would get to a number, if that person had already received a prize, I just moved down one. And then I thought, gosh, I, there was such a struggle to get 23 prizes to people by doing the random num number generator. So I went on Ravelry in my thread and you can look up um, the voices in the thread, like how many people talked and who talked the most. And so I decided, you know what? That was part of this whole cow, was supporting one another and commenting in the section. And Suzanne had 121 posts. So Suzanne, you are also getting, <laughs> because I just thought that's a great way to reward someone for being an uplifter. You know, things are tough in everybody's lives right now. And so if you're out there taking the time to be in a, a support person in my group, I thought, I will just look and see who made the most posts. So I hope that's okay with everyone, but that goes to Suzanne in Indiana and she had already won a bag and I thought, good for her, <laughs> she gets two things. All right, then number eight goes to Debbie in Illinois and I am giving the pink little knit stitch bag as well as because this is a potted bag, I have one of these little sweater chalkboards and so I put it inside the bag because that will pad it. And um, that was from the dollar store, but it's, or from the dollar section at Target. But it's really cute. And then there's some uh, stitch markers um, that are going in some of these bags are gonna have, not all of them, but I went through and found um, some stitch markers and some little tools. I have been cleaning out a little bit of my office area and I found some extra tape measures and a sock ruler and just some things like that. And I had duplicates of a lot of things. I had some like little yarn ball holders that you put over the outside of your yarn ball so it doesn't fall apart. And I had a stack of them that I'd never used. So I made up some little bags and I just randomly stuck them in some of these envelopes. So some of you will be getting just a little extra treat in your bag. Okay, then post number nine, I have these over here in a box. This is a bee woolen bag with a, um, gauge measure and a little a few extra things and this is going to wool stock and that's janet in minnesota and i know jane i'm adding number 10 in right here because i have to talk a little bit about this so number 10 is media specialist and that's mary and i know mary and she's in my library knitters group that meets on tuesdays and she won the book Sut by sutton foster hooked and as a part of my clean out process, I had found a few other knitting books and I was gonna give them away one to each viewer, you know, and do a drawing. And I have 23 packages to mail out already. So I decided to just put the books together. So I had stacked them up all together and then Mary won and she's local, so I won't have to ship all of these. But I thought I would show you the books that Mary's gonna get that she can also share with her friends because they're all about knitting. So this one is an, the amazing thing about The Way It Goes by Stephanie Pearl McPhee. And if you have not read any of Stephanie's books and you want a laugh about knitting, highly recommend. Uh, knitting Ephemera, this is a compendium of articles useful and otherwise for the edification and amusement of the hand knitter. It's just a lovely little book. Here is a Monica Ferris book. If you have not ever read any of the Monica Ferris um, books, they are uh, mysteries. They're done with either needlework or yarn or counted cross stitch. Um, if this book is called Black Work, let me tell you. Monica Ferris is the USA Today best-selling author of several mystery series under various pseudonyms. She lives in Minnesota. And these books take place m most of the time the, the ones I've read in Excelsior, Minnesota, and there used to be a yarn shop, and one of the books mentions my mentor, Rosemary. Um, she, she knows, like, she's on page 43 in whatever book because the person walks into the yarn shop and Rosemary's sitting there helping people, which is what Rosemary always used to do. So these are really fun, easy reads, li nice little mysteries. And then this one is called Knitting Yarns, and it is by Ann Hood, and it's Writers on Knitting. And they, they're just, guy, here's a whole list of the people who just did 
a little essay on knitting. It's just lovely. So you can read one at a time, you know, kind of one each day if you want, or just kind of go through the whole thing. And then here is Knitlandia. I have Knitlandia by Claire Parks, and I read it, and I thought, I just, I have so many books. And I decided to keep the pattern books because those are resources for me. And so the reading books I need to pass along. So this is uh, Knitlandia. And then the last one is um, A Life in Stitches, Knitting My Way Through Love, Loss, and Laughter. And this is Rachel Heron, who has also wrote some knitting, um, knitting themed romance. And this is her book that has um, 20 different um, pieces in it. Um, as where she just talks about um, casting on, slip knot. She, each, each chapter has a little circular knitting, has a little essay as well. So Mary, you are lucky enough <laughs> to get all the Cory books because I thought that was gonna be easier for me for shipping and then I don't have to ship them because you're local. So. Number 11, this is a Tompton kit to make a little Tompton elf, wood fairies. You've got everything in there to make the kit. I had two of those to give away. There's a little baggie in the bottom of this one I see, and that goes to Lacewing on Heather. And that's Heather in Maine, I believe. Number 12. This is a second Tomton kit, and there's a few little goodies in that one too. And that goes it to Larie Knit in Minnesota. Congratulations, Larie. Uh, then I had two little kits similar to the Tomton kits. But they're little hat box kits. You get a little wooden box, and then you have a little pattern to knit it a little cover. You can knit it a hat or whatever. They're just darling. So I had two of those. And that goes to K8R Cater. Uh, that's Linda in Michigan. Number 14 is always also a hat box. Uh, and that goes to Care Bear, Karen in Massachusetts. Do you see why I had to get organized this morning? I had so many. Okay, this is going to Nicole Pearl, and this is a poster that I purchased, and I had an extra. I wanna take it out so I can show you all, because it's really cute. You can find them online. It has a little sleeve on it here. But it says, knitting keeps me from unraveling. Isn't that neat? Isn't that cute? Okay, so that's going to Nicole Pearl. That's Nicole in California, and I honestly, I kept the box, which is amazing, because then it won't get damaged in its shipment. So, Nicole, also get in touch. I keep saying that, but I need everybody's addresses. It's going to be a big shipping, big shipping bill for me. So, number 16, yarn and stitch markers. That's Super Steph, Steph in Redmond, Washington, and you are getting a skein of you are getting a skein of knit style yarn. Isn't that pretty? And as well as a little baggie with some stitch markers and a tiny little scissors. <laughs> Number 17, you are getting a skein of socks that rock and a nitty knotty. And if you've never used a mini nitty knotty before, if you have um, small amounts of yarn to wind up, these can be purchased online and you can get a little, and then you wind around it to make mini skeins, to make little mini skeins. And it comes apart, it's super cute. So for those of you that don't know what that is, there's also a little cute little keychain in this prize package. So that is going to Lacey Babe, and that's Peggy. Peggy lives in the US. Number 18, you are getting a skein of Knitting Rose yarn and a sock ruler. And that goes to Emily Sow, Emily in Minnesota. Number 19, this is a, bag, uh, a skein of Hazelnitz yarn. I have a hard time giving that one away. I hope you love it, Joyce in Akron. And Joyce, you're getting some buttons and some double pointed needles in there. So I, ha I had maybe three sets of double pointed needles to give away as well. 
There was um, a couple of, um, there was a, a metal set, then a carbons set, and then the signatures. Um, so then here is number 20. This has a skein of yarn and some of those sock holder, uh, ball holders, little. And here you're getting the Leading Men Fiber Arts yarn. And I'm gonna show this so you guys all know what I'm talking about, because I have a little stack of these. And so I split them up. So it's those little yarn bras that you put around your yarn. And I had just a bunch of them stacked. And I love them. I use them all the time. So I stuck those in, in a couple of bags as I was organizing for this. That's 20. Number 21 gets the, I put, I put this package of yarn, which came from Barocco. There's a little baggie in there. And then I put that in this bag. And then it was the last, one of the last things I drew because I had set it to the side because all the other bags were stacked up. So number 21, that is 077 Tab Mom. Susan in Eskridge, Kansas. So Susan, you get a big package here. Number 22, we're almost done. This is a skein of stitch together yarn. And then you have a little prize, um, surprise goodies kind of like a little grab bag that I put together in there and that goes to um, Cindy Ann Bukite and that's Cindy in Missouri and this one is the signature needles and that is uh, two signatures sets of double pointed needles and one circular needle and that's going to Diane in Minneapolis and she is alchemy so that is the prizes. I would say with 23 prizes, you know, like two thirds to three quarters of the people won a prize. I need you all to get in touch with me. Give me your first and last name, your address, and I will get them out in the mail. Just I'll do them in little spurts as I go to, you know, take other ones. I may wait a day, but I will get them out. I have the post office, you know, a mile from my house. So it's pretty easy for me to do that and I will get them all out to you. It was just such a fun knit along. I had so much more um, participation than any other knit along I've done before. We had like 849 posts in that thread and uh, I'm just really thankful I, that all of you liked the Pairs of Socks collection as much as I did. I will post the list of all prizes in my Ravelry group. I will put it in the show notes and I will link people on Ravelry eventually, maybe not today, but in the next couple of days. So they'll get a message to watch the podcast. I just don't want to be sitting on prizes for a while. So there you go. Thank you all.